Steel plate, produced by BHP for the Westgate Bridge Authority to specifications requiring maximum yield strength, was the construction material used for the fabrication of box girders, a new type of bridge construction for this country. The original contractors, World Services and Construction, designed and built the steel fabrication workshops on the site, and this work proceeded parallel with the construction of the concrete approach viaducts. Prefabricated steel panels for a total of 54 specially designed steel boxes were made here. The panels were all pre-drilled before leaving the workshop for storage against construction demands. These original plates, stiffened with bulb flats and transverse stiffeners, were later to be redesigned. Box girder erection problems were to complicate the work of accurately matching half box units during the operation of jacking them up to pier height. The work being carried out here in 1970 was using the most highly developed techniques of design and fabrication available at that time. Since construction commenced in 1968, a high production rate was achieved and while the steel fabrication was proceeding, the concrete approach viaduct and foundation were completed within the prescribed time and within the agreed total financial cost. The completed panels and decking were grit blasted, exterior surfaces being hot zinc sprayed and interior surfaces coated with protective red lead. All exterior panel surfaces also received multi-coatings of special protective paint. Work progressed steadily to ensure that with the completion of the pier construction, steel panels would be for on-site assembly of the half-box girders and their elevation to the pier tops. The panels of stiffened steel plate were stored in a stillage area on the east side of the Yarra River. With accurately matched drill holes, the plates were connected using high tensile grip bolts. Consideration had been given to a stiffened plate form of deck as used in some new European bridges. However, the problem associated with the Australian manufacture and welding of such a system were considered to be so great that the decision to use a steel and concrete slab deck was made. The original concrete deck was to have been composite with a steel deck plate which was studded with sheer connectors. The design considerations were acceptable and if safely erected with the concrete in position would have been a viable system. When the half boxes were assembled they were moved to the erection site where they were bolted together to form half girt 44 meters in length. In accordance with contract requirements, this contractor, with the approval of the consultants, proposed to use conventional jacking methods to erect the half-box girders. Each half-girder would be jacked to pier-top level and transferred to rails, where they'd be pulled laterally together on special rollers. The rails on which the girders would be moved were first installed on the piers. The individual half-box sections were assembled alongside the piers, where they were bolted together in readiness for their erection. Each half girder, as it was completed, was ready to be lifted inch by inch in a series of jacking cycles. The jacks were placed in position and all appeared to be in order at this stage of construction. The erection plan was developed by contractors who have had a considerable background of experience throughout the world. But here, they were working with a virtually as yet untried group of circumstances. All went well with the system of erection. The problems which were later to develop resulted from the fact that the half-box girders, without their integrated concrete decking, lacked sufficient strength to avoid some distortion when they were lifted at both ends. In the meantime, the system functioned well, the half-box girders being lifted on the east side. When these girders were pulled together, satisfactory unions were obtained and they could be bolted together. The half girders were gradually winched together on the special rollers traveling on the rails fitted to the pier tops. 
It later became apparent that although the two half-girders, when bolted together and capped with a composite concrete decking, were completely viable from the point of view of strength and reliability, in their half-sections, the box-girders could not survive the erection process without some distortion. In this initial situation on the east side, the half-sections came together without trouble. But when the procedure was repeated on the west side, buckling of the flanges occurred. In October 1970, distortion occurred during the lifting of the west side half-girders and attempts to correct the distortion by the use of Kentledge and the removal of some bolts resulted in the collapse, which brought down the girder comprising eight boxes and one of the supporting piers. The crash, with its loss of life, brought the steel span design into question and a Royal Commission report was critical of the overseas designers and the absence of specific erection procedures for the box type of structure they'd recommended. Following the Royal Commission's report, the authority set up a Directorate of Engineering and a consulting engineer, Hans Wolfram. Jerry Hardenberg from World Services was appointed Chief Resident Engineer. The new Directorate carried out a thorough appraisal of the entire system of the steel span design. As a result, it was decided to eliminate the composite concrete steel deck and replace it with orthotropic steel decking using thicker steel and a new method of stiffening the deck plates. Meanwhile, numerous tests were made in Australia and overseas. These included wind tunnel tests at Monash University, where the effects of wind gusts at various velocities and forced oscillation of the bridge at various frequencies gave the bridge and its suspension system a clean bill of health in every respect. The girder, with its sloping side web construction, indicated superior aerodynamic characteristics than would have been the case with rectangular box construction elements. Members of the Engineering Directorate observed manufacturing processes overseas and decided that Australia possessed the expertise to produce orthotropic decking. The new decking would be of half-inch steel plate stiffened with multiple longitudinal trough stiffeners and transfer stiffeners to produce a structure which could handle multi-directional tensions resulting from both global and live stresses to be expected in the completed structure. The longitudinal stiffeners were shaped using continuous cold rolled steel. The troughs were cut to the desired length. They were then prepared for welding to the deck plate along the tracks where the deck plate had been ground to provide a clean metal to metal contact during the automatic welding process. The troughs were tack welded to the deck plate. After tacking, the welds were carefully trimmed. Using a multi-head submerged arc welding system, the troughs were continuously welded to the deck plates, the welding temperatures being carefully controlled to avoid any weakening of the steel. The steel used throughout the construction had a notched ductility which was adequate to cope with the welding temperatures reached at any time during construction. The term orthotropic is applied to the decking because it describes a system of construction which exhibits the same properties in all directions when subjected to random stresses. Transverse stiffeners are welded to the underside of the decking. As each component was completed, it was sandblasted, hot zinc sprayed on the exterior surfaces, and then sprayed with protective paints on the interior surfaces. Parallel with the fabrication of the new orthotropic decking, the many boxes which had already been assembled by the old method in the stillage area were disassembled and rebuilt according to new designs. The main feature of which was the completely new decking and additional stiffening and reinforcement of the component panels of each box.
Temporary supports were erected under each one of the 12 boxes still in the air on the piers on the eastern side of the river. These were jacked up to provide adequate support at each end of the box before the decking was removed from them. Each box was reinforced and reassembled at pier top level. On the western side, after cleaning up operations had been completed following the collapse, temporary false work on the western tower pier was erected using a 20-ton tower crane. Meanwhile, the decking on the eastern girder boxes was removed. The closely spaced deck shear connectors were part of the proposed composite concrete steel deck design. The oxy cutting of the deck and its removal was a mammoth task and something quite unusual in Australian engineering experience. The deck had been whitewashed to reduce the heating of the box on sunny days. This kept working temperatures within the boxes at a tolerable level. Inside the boxes, temporary trusses were installed to support the side panels when the decking had to be removed. With the panels of the boxes secure, the work of adding stiffening to the individual boxes could now continue. On the west side, a large platform measuring 49 by 27 meters had been installed on the tower pier. The first two boxes were assembled piecemeal using the tower crane. This was the first section of the steel construction on the west side to be completed. The base of the west cable tower was installed. The new type of orthotropic decking was lifted to pier level for installation on the assembled boxes. With the installation of two gantry cranes, boxes could now be cantilevered in both directions. The complete half boxes being lifted from pontoons after having been floated across the river from the east side stillage area. This method of directly lifting the half boxes was to continue satisfactorily without incident until the box girder steel spans had been completed. The only exception to the lifting of the half boxes was with the lifting of the heavier cable anchoring boxes, these being lifted in three sections and assembled at deck level. Construction proceeded with the knowledge that no other bridge of this type anywhere in the world had been subjected to such considerable review and redesign. The redesign was initially based on the latest West German bridge code. The British Merison Committee's report became available in 1972, and the authority decided to check the bridge design also against the Merison rules. Both German and British designs were independently checked by the engineering directorate before being submitted to a final check by the proof engineer, Professor Roy, who said, design computations carried out by the engineering directorate of the authority are considerably more extensive in scope and accuracy of detail than is normally the practice. The design computations not only meet the requirements of the relevant German codes, but they're also in accordance with Britain's appraisal rules for steel box girder bridges. I am convinced that the most careful measures have been taken to avoid and to eliminate any uncertainties or error. The first of the two cable supporting towers was erected on the west side. The special tower erecting system was designed to be used also as a cable erecting device. The towers will have a total height of nearly 46 meters above the bridge deck, which at low water will give a navigation clearance of nearly 59 meters. The cable saddle is lifted to complete the west tower. The procedure for the erection of the east tower was essentially the same but it was not required until the east span reached the river's edge, since temporary props were used to support the boxes extending westward beyond the eastern tower pier. Since the western tower was located in the river, construction should only continue beyond two boxes by using temporary cables, and then by permanent cables to proceed by cantilever construction out from either side of the west tower.
The first of the temporary cables were installed to permit cantilevering of the boxes to continue. The cables were stressed hydraulically to the tensions required to support the first sections of the main river spans. The temporary cables were anchored at deck level, but as the permanent cables were installed, these were anchored within the anchoring modules in the anchor boxes located in the center of their boxes. A total of eight of these special modules anchor to the ends of the inner and outer permanent cables of the bridge system. One of the east side cable anchoring modules is lifted into position. Box erection on the west side had now proceeded beyond the inner temporary cables and the first of the permanent cables were installed. These cables consist of spiral strands each 15 centimeters in diameter and made up of 178 galvanized round wires in seven layers over a king strand of three wires. Each strand was pre-stressed before the cable was made up. The cables were thoroughly cleaned down and protected with an application of metal coat, an aluminium preparation with extremely effective weather protection properties. Within the anchor boxes, temporary hydraulic erection equipment was installed to tighten the permanent cables as they were installed. The trapezoidal box girder construction of the steel bridge comprises five main spans. At each end of the steel section, an expansion joint compensates for variations due to temperature changes and to a lesser extent bridge loading. The variations could produce up to 38 centimeters of movement plus or minus in the length of the span between the concrete viaducts. The suspension cables are fixed at the top of the saddles of the towers and the towers themselves are mounted on bearings which permit them to compensate for temperature and load changes. The construction pattern had by now become well established and the gap in the center span was at this stage closing rapidly as half boxes were ferried to the middle of the river and lifted into position by the 135 ton gantry cranes. The box girders are each divided into three compartments by vertical webs. The outer panels are inclined. The shape of the sides of the bridge reduce the effect of winds on the sides of the structure. The design change from composite steel concrete deck to the orthotropic battle deck construction resulted in an increase in the total weight of steel used in the project. However, the net result with the elimination of the concrete was a 10% reduction in the total weight of the structure. The temporary props on the east side had now reached the river edge and the system of temporary and permanent cables was installed before the final boxes would be lifted into their positions. On the west side, one gap remained to be filled in the box girder. From the top of the east tower looking to the west side, the outer permanent cables are installed on the east side. The two spans, extended by the cantilever principle, are within one box unit of linking together. At this stage, preparations are made for the lifting and installation of the remaining half-box sections. The last two boxes have been made with their decks about 20 centimeters shorter to ensure that they'll fit into the remaining gap. The deck of each box has been trimmed to match the camber of the bridge before the deck plates have been welded. Before the last two boxes are installed, cable tensions are adjusted until the profile of the bridge span is correct and the two halves of the central span are in exact alignment. The second last half box was floated to the middle of the river to be lifted and to finally link the two half spans together.
This is a day for celebration and a tribute to the men who had the vision to see this great engineering enterprise through to a successful conclusion. The installation of the last half box completes the construction of the river span of the bridge which has a length between the cable towers of 337 meters. The erection method, using the 135 ton cranes to lift the half boxes, has proved completely successful during all stages of reconstruction and new construction. The first chips pass under the bridge. Within the box sections, Planches are bolted together and the long span is at last locked up and secure. The entire construction has been an engineering program unique in the world and Melbourne can be proud of the structure which has resulted from the enterprise and drive of a small group of far-seeing people. The final commissioning of the Westgate Bridge involved accurate welding of the deck plates the removal of temporary cables and of the hydraulic hardware used in the tensioning of all the cables. High strength side rails are installed. A wheelabrator machine grit blasts the entire surface of the deck after which it's coated with inorganic zinc. Electrical, telephone and video cables are installed. The bridge lighting system incorporates the most modern development in lighting using high pressure sodium lamps on masts nearly 19 meters tall. An epoxy bitumen surface is applied to the steel decking. With long life and anti-skid properties, this surface is expected to provide reliable road holding qualities under all conditions. For Mr. Oscar Meyer, Chairman of the Authority, this is a great day. For he's shouldered a tremendous responsibility during the past ten years. He's proud to shake the hand of the Honourable R.J. Hamer, whose government throughout the troubled construction program never failed to maintain its confidence in the Authority. The operation of the bridge is controlled by one of the most up-to-date systems in the world. From this control panel, one operator, with the assistance of an elaborate closed-circuit television system, can observe everything that's happening on the bridge. A close view of any car on the bridge can be obtained by zooming, panning and tilting controls on the TV cameras. The cost of the bridge will be borne by the user and this new addition to Melbourne's traffic system has been built without cost to the taxpayer. Coins to the required value are simply thrown into a receptacle and the driver is immediately free to cross the bridge. The bridge authority has installed safety equipment which includes round-the-clock vigilance to cope with such situations as breakdowns, fires or cars running out of petrol. The outstanding conceptual design of the British designers Maunsell and Partner and Freeman Fox and the expertise of Redpath Norman Long brought outstanding international experience to the project in association with the Australian companies Johns and Waygood who supplied the steel components and John Holland Holdings, who carried out the work in the field which led to the successful completion of the project. The high-level bridge provides eight traffic lanes and two breakdown lanes. The expressway now provides improved accessibility between eastern and western Melbourne.
The result already has been an accelerated development in the western areas served by the new route and a reduction in traffic congestion and in the number of road accidents in some areas. The bridge has a capacity to cope with more than 160,000 cars per day should the occasion demand. The bridge has been designed to cope with wind forces twice as great as can be expected at any time during a 100 year period. The sloping sides of the boxes provide aerodynamics which can cope with very high side winds and violent gusts. Longitudinally, the cable system provides effective dampening of the central river span. With its modern, high-intensity lighting system, the bridge has been designed to provide Melbourne traffic with a safe 24-hour link between east and west. The West Gate Bridge, gateway to the west.